good evening, depending on what part of the world you're in, where you happen to be. Good morning, my name is Damien, the tall, friendly atheist dad and host of the Tall, Friendly Atheist Dad podcast. So yeah, if you head on over to uh, YouTube, uh, head on over to anchor.fm forward slash TFA dad, or even just check out the uh, what's down the crawl on the bottom of the screen. Uh, yeah, you'll find the podcast and uh, yeah, all the stuff uh, that I do online as the Tall Friendly Atheist Dad. And welcome to part one of a new reading series of the book Smith Wigglesworth, Apostle of Faith by Stanley Howard Frodsham. Now, for me, this is a trip uh, trip down memory lane because... Oh, I've got a comment already. Oh, yeah. Hey, Jax. Hope everything is all right with you over there. Evening. It's morning. In the in the in the correct part of the world, it's morning, and I won't take no for an answer. So yeah, so this book uh, goes into my uh, goes into my uh, into my past just because I used to be a uh, a charismatic, and my pastors recommended this book to me as an example of what you know walking in the power of the faith uh, looks like. So and yeah, I took a, I took a fair few cues from this uh, from this book. Um, so yeah, feel, it feels a bit weird, uh, you know, uh, rereading rereading again from a critical perspective. But uh, I'm going to read it, and hopefully you're going to enjoy it. And oh, hello! The the reading sun is here. Would you like to say hello? Okay, that's a bored 12-year-old boy's uh, way of saying hello. <laughs> very true, Jax, very true. Very true. So, yeah. Um, uh, I was say, so, yeah, so, uh, so reading this book from a critical perspective, but also from a, um, a 2020s perspective, because even in the last, you know, 20 or so years, you know, my perspective on... Yeah, my perspective on life has changed a lot. So uh, yeah, so I'm going to start with. Uh, most people start at the at the start, so I'm going to start from chapter one, which is called "First the Blade." But once I give my son a hug and I slap him on the back, hopefully you can hear that slap on the back, because my boy is a very chunky boy. Hmm. Hmm. And yes, we kind of need hugs today because it is a very, it's a very cold day today. Um, it is, just trying to think, it's about 10 degrees at the moment. Um, well, 10 degrees Celsius, which is about, it's about 45 to 50 Fahrenheit. Chunky boy. Yeah, Jack, Jack, call, Jack's called you Chunky boy. It's Chonky, C-H-O-N-K-Y. Chonky. Look, look it up. You, you know. Yeah, you're going to sit here or in your room? You're going to sit in the warm bed. Okay, no worries. So this is chapter one and called First the Blade. So in three, two, one. The year 1859 is known as that of the Great Irish Revival. Two years previously, a mighty awakening had come to America. Prayer meetings had been held in every large city and were attended by thousands of people. As men called on God, the Spirit of the Lord mightily worked, and it was estimated that every month 50,000 souls were converted. The news of the revival of 1857 in the USA and the revival of 1859 in Ireland set the people of Britain to praying. Soon, revival fires began to burn throughout that country. Spurgeon preached to vast throngs in London, and at every service many received Jesus Christ as their Saviour and Lord. In Wales, Christmas Evans was engaged in a wonderful evan evangelistic ministry. His converts became so exuberantly happy that they would dance for joy in his meetings, and Evans would not restrain them. Because of this, Scores of sinners sought Christ in order to receive the same joy unspeakable. At the same time, the hearts of many who were attending the Wesleyan Methodist churches throughout Great Britain 
were strangely warmed. One of their evangelists, William Booth, was singularly used. In 1859, he broke with the Wesleyan Church to give himself entirely to the work of evangelism, and was led to choose the slums of the east of London as his first place of ministry. The worst of sinners were transformed into the greatest of saints, and went preaching the gospel throughout the land. Booth later founded the Salvation Army. It was in this revival year of 1859, in a humble shack in Menston, in Yorkshire, England, that Smith Wigglesworth was born. One day, he was holding a meeting in Riversdale, California. We said to him, Tell us your story! He related to us the following. So, let me just change position here because someone has uh, decided to take up real estate next to me. That's right, he's cute. He can take up real estate next to me. That's fine. Um, yeah, so, this is... Uh, even even in this first section, I've already noticed a couple of things worth, uh, worth noting. Um, 1851. What was that two years before? That was two years before the Civil War. So it's interesting that, um, you know, it, one year, you know, there can be revivals all around the world. Well, actually, as you know, so, so, so 1859, the Great Irish Revival, and then two years previously, there was a, an awakening coming to America. So, base, so base, basically 1857. So 1857, there's a revival. 1861, there's a war to decide you know, basically, or well, basically over slavery. And, yeah, it's... Uh, I've, I've mentioned this a, a few times where, you know, either slavery was, was the right thing to do and the Union, uh, you know, wasted, you know, lots of... Like, the, the Union militarily tried to impose their will on people who were righteously observing God's word, or... God has no problem letting 600,000 people die in a war to make sure that his his correct theology prevails. It has to be either one. And uh, yeah, I'd be interested to know where these uh, where these revivals took place and if any of them took place in the South. Uh, from, from the research I did for my book, The Best Religion for the Task at Hand, um, there were I did read of reports of revivals breaking out on both sides of the conflict, both in the in the Union and in the Confederate States. So it just seems it, it just seems that um like just from this uh, from this paragraph there's, there's a couple of paragraphs here that you know um, revival has like it would be interesting it would be interesting to like wonder why you know in 1857 you know god you know, god touches the people of america and then four years later they they go to war and it's like well hold on you know you got those people in the south called slaves who who are having their their freedoms in their lives curtailed you know shouldn't someone go down there and tell them that you know hey guys you know try to get rid of your slaves or something and uh writer for life 724 makes the point Six hundred thousand die in war, horrible. Almost seven hundred thousand die to a disease. Well, <laughs> yes. And if you jump on the YouTube channel, I was uh, luckily enough to interview the coronavirus. Uh, so you jump on the YouTube channel. Um, it may even be up on my Twitter because uh, the coronavirus uh, retweeted the interview that I did with it, and there was some. Now there's a, a father son war breaking up between coronavirus and the Delta variant. And um, yeah, so check that out. It was actually quite interesting listen, listening to a virus explain its story. A um, little bit scary, but if you're vaxxed, um, he won't he won't hurt you as much. So uh, the next thing to to note is that um, yeah, um, when when evangelists tell their own anecdotes, um, it's uh, something you just got. Sometimes you got to take it with a pinch of salt. So anyway, let's um. So I'll get into the next part of the chapter, which is called Wigglesworth Tells of Early Life. And in this instance, it looks like he's relating it in first person. So three, can I have a click? My father was very poor and worked long hours for little pay in order to support mother and us three boys and one girl. 
I can remember one cold frosty day when my father had been given the job of digging a ditch seven yards long and a yard deep and filling it up again for the sum of three shillings and sixpence, about 87 cents. My mother said that if he would, if he would only wait a bit, it might thaw and his task would be easier. But he needed that money for food, for there was none in the house. So he set to work with a pickaxe. The frost was a full yard deep, but underneath the hard ground was some soft wet clay. As he threw up some of this, a robin suddenly appeared, picked up a worm, ate it, flew to a branch of a nearby tree, and from there sent out a song of joyous praise. Up to now, father had been very despondent, but he was so entranced by the robin's lovely song of thanksgiving that he took fresh courage and began to dig with a renewed vigour, saying to himself, If that robin can sing like that for a worm, surely I can work like a father for my good wife and my four fine children. When I was six years of age, I got work in the field, pulling and cleaning turnips, and I can remember how sore my tiny hands became pulling turnips from morning until night. At seven years of age, my older brother and I went to work in a woolen mill. My father obtained employment in the same mill as a weaver. Things were easy in our house from that time on, and food became more plentiful. My father was a great lover of birds, and at one time he had 16 songbirds in our home. Like my father, I had a great love for birds, and at every opportunity, I would be out looking for their nests. I always knew there were some 80 or 90 of them. One time I found a nest full of fledglings, and thinking they were abandoned, I adopted them, taking them home and making a place for them in my bedroom. Somehow, the parent birds discovered them and would fly in through the open window and feed their young ones. One time, I had both a thrush and a lark feeding their young ones in my room. My brothers and I would catch some songbirds, bring them home, and sell, later sell them in, in the market. So, I'm going to quickly pause here because... Uh, this kind of starts to tie in with uh, another book I'm reading, The People of the Abyss, and that's also on my YouTube channel as well, where um, it looks like the England, uh, well, some people would still say England now, but definitely England around the turn of, uh, of the 1900s uh, was a very cruel place. Um, poverty was abound. Um, yeah, people were miserable. People were dying of diseases. Um, all, all that kind of stuff. Where, whereas, whereas now, um, yeah, where, whereas, whereas now, like you know, um, children don't go to work. Children go to school. Um, you know, we don't send six-year-olds out to the field to pull and clean turnips, per, turnips, for eighty, uh, you know, for for a pittance. Like, we don't send people to dig holes for eighty-seven cents. And it just would have been interesting that if. If God was interested in helping, like firstly helping children, you know, become educated, uh, helping children live live longer, and like helping helping people live long and prosperous lives, you know, like a, a revival in here, you know, a revival in the colonies would would have been the best time to go. Well, look, guys, you know, this is how you farm, guys. This is electricity. Guys, this is you know this is all you need to know about agricultural science. Yeah, you know, this is how you feed. This is you know all, all all that kind of stuff. But I just find that yeah, um, even even after a time of revival, you know, people are still having to you know, work by the sweat of their brow and you know catch birds and sell them in in, in the market. And it's just there's just like I suppose maybe I'm wrong for speaking from a 21st century perspective. But it's just, um, yeah, it's it's just weird that, you know, it's taken us like, you know, 2,000 years since Christ for us to work out, okay, this is how you help people live. This is medical science. This is agricultural science. And not that we've got, got it all figured out, but, you know, it's better than, you know, going through a cold winter, not having much food and, uh, yeah, all, all this kind of stuff. So anyway, um, and Writer for Life 724 makes a comment. It's all connected. 
And this, this is one reason why, you know, I chose this book was because one, it goes into my past, but also, um, yeah, it is, is, is connected to the people of the abyss. So in three, two, one, my mother was very industrious with her needle and made all our clothes, chiefly from old garments that had been given to her. I usually wore an overcoat with sleeves three or four inches too long, which was very comfortable in cold weather. I cannot forget those long winter nights and mornings, having to get out of bed at five o'clock to snatch a quick meal and then walk two miles to be at work by six. We had to work 12 hours each day and often said to my father, it's a long time from six until six in the mill. I can remember the tears in his eyes as he said, well, six, six o'clock will always come. Sometimes it seemed like a month coming. I can never rec recollect a time when I did not long for God. Even though neither father nor mother knew God, I was always seeking him. I would often kneel down in the field and ask him to help me. I would ask him especially to enable me to find where the birds' nests were. And after I had prayed, I seemed to have an instinct to know exactly where to look. One time, I walked to work in a great thunderstorm. It seemed that for half an hour I was enveloped with fire as the thunders rolled and the lightnings flashed. Young as I was, my heart was crying to God for his preservation, and he wrapped me in his gracious presence. Though all the way I was surrounded with lightning and I was drenched to the skin, I knew no fear. I only sensed that I was being shielded by the power of God. My mother was an old-time Wesleyan Methodist and would take me to the meeting she attended. When I was eight years of age, there was a revival meeting held in her church. I can remember one Sunday morning at seven o'clock when all those simple folks were dancing round a big stove in the centre of the church, clapping their hands and singing. Okay. So, Rider for Life 724 makes a comment. Anecdotes. They're everywhere. And yes, this is a... Put that away. Um, yeah, this is a, I suppose, a biography. And when a, dev when a devout Christian is writing about the life of a devout Christian, um, anecdotes are as good as the gospel. Like, you know, it's, uh, it's almost as if Jesus was, was, was saying the words, you know. But yeah, I do find that... Um, It will be interesting to wonder if he was in, let's say, Saudi Arabia, or if he was in, you know, in Africa or, you know, in Indonesia, you know, getting up at six in the morning to, to go to work. You know, would he be a Muslim? Would he would he be a Christian or would he be Muslim? Would he be a Buddhist? Would he be a would he be a Scientologist? Would he be? You know, it just seems that um, there is a strong statistical preponderance that people uh, accept the religion that is predominant in their culture. So, anyway, uh, back, to the, back to the book. As I clapped my hands and sang with them, a clear knowledge of the new birth came into my soul. I looked to the Lamb of Calvary. I believed that He loved me and had died for me. Life came in, eternal life. And I knew that I had received a new life which had come from God. I was born again. I saw that God wants us so badly that he has made the condition as simple as he possibly could. Only believe. That experience was real and I've never doubted my salvation since that day. But I had no words. The longer I lived the more I thought but the less language I had to express my thoughts. In this respect, I resembled my mother. She would begin to tell a story, but what she said was so unintelligible that father would have to interrupt, saying, Nay, mother, you have to begin again. She, could, she, she just could not express herself. I was the same. But I delighted in going to meetings, especially those in which everyone was giving a testimony. I would arise to give mine, but would have no language to convey what I felt in the depths of my soul. Invariably, I would burst out crying. One memorable day, three old men, whom I knew very intimately, came across to where I was weeping, unable to speak. They laid their hands on me. 
the Spirit of the Lord came upon me, and I was instantly set free from my bondage. I not only believed, but I could also speak. From the time of my conversion, I became a soul winner, and the first person I won for Christ was my own dear mother. Okay, so let me uh, pause it there for a sec. Um, yes, anecdotes, anecdotes, anecdotes everywhere. Um, but I would love to get if anyone uh, was listening or just happened to just happened to know um, the 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 way that religious exper- experiences work, like why he could not why he could not feel he could speak until you know three people laid their hands on him. Um, stuff like that, and why he couldn't, you know, why he couldn't speak, and why he could only express himself in in, in tears. Um, but yeah, it's. Uh, um, but this sentence here, I saw that God wants us so wants us so badly that He's made the condition as simple as He possibly could. Only believe. Well, sure, that's that is uh, that that's a that's nice. But you need to have evidence to believe. If you're going to make um, the conditions for salvation uh, reliant upon accepting, you know, things without good evidence, then why why don't we just believe in the flying spaghetti monster or in the you know, or in other in in, in other deities who are equally as uh, irrational? Uh, but then he goes, that experience was real, and I've never doubted my salvation since that day. Um, the problem was I was I was like that as well. You know, I believed I had real experiences, and you know I didn't doubt my salvation and, and things like that. But um, this is the thing back in uh, back in the eighteen fifties and eighteen sixties. You know, um, uh, you know the the scientific method wasn't really picking up. Science and knowledge as currency weren't really uh, you know, weren't really there. So look, I, I get that. Uh, religion, religion was the currency of the of the culture, and so yeah, like you know, people like you, if you went to church and saw a child crying, now you would go, oh my gosh, you know, what kind of environment are they uh, bringing those kids up in? And I uh, specifically reference Jesus camp for that. But um, whereas here, you know, going to church and seeing a child cry, and then like having adults lay hands on the kid, that was like. Yeah, sure, that was, that was acceptable. And um, Writer for Life 724 says there's like 10 answers to that question. And I'm sure there would be. I'd love to get... Yes, you, you, you want to read, You want to read? is it? Okay, so if you want to read, um, when I was nine years of age, down the bottom here, the last, last few sentences. When I was nine years of age, I was tall. And so I got full-time work in the mill. School was not compulsory in those, those days, and so I was robbed of an education. Father wanted all of us to go to the... Uh, you lost the... Ah, uh, the, to the... Okay, yep. Episcopal. Episcopal Church. He had no desire to go himself, but he liked the parson because they met at the same pub and drank beer together. My brother and I were in the choir in this church, and although I could not read, I soon learned the tunes of the hymns and chants. Hymns. Hymns. It's a silent N. You want to keep going? Because Jack says good to hear you, and uh, please keep going. You've got a fan. Mm. Uh, so when most of the up here when most of the boys in the choir were 12 years of age they had been they had to be confirmed by the bishop I was not 12 but between 9 and 10 when the bishop laid his hands on me I can remember that that as he imposed his hands I had a similar experience to the one I had 40 years later when I was baptised in the Holy Spirit my whole body was filled with the consciousness of God's presence, a consciousness that consciousness that remained with me for days. After the confirmation service, all the other boys were swearing and quarrelling, and I wondered what had made the difference between them and me. 
Very good. Yay! So that is, uh, that is the, that was the, uh, tall, friendly, reading sun. Well, the kind of, yeah, it's you kind of tall. Yeah, just not quite as tall as dad, but that's, that's all right. So, uh, back to, uh, to the next paragraph. When I was 13, we moved to Bradford. There, I went to the Wesleyan Methodist Church and began to enter into a deeper spiritual life. I was very keen for God. This church was having some special missionary meetings, and they chose seven boys to speak. I was... Sorry, coffee burp. I was one of the seven chosen, and I had three weeks in which to get ready for a 15-minute talk. For three weeks, I lived in prayer. I remember that as I began, there were such loud amens and shoutings. I do not recollect what I said, but I know I was possessed with a mighty zeal, a burning desire to get people to know my Saviour. At that time, I was always getting in touch with boys and talking to them about salvation. I had many rebuffs and rebukes. I wanted to share the great joy I had, but so many did not seem too eager to listen to me. And that was a great mystery to me. I suppose I was not very tactful. I always carried a New Testament with me, even though I was not able to read much. Um, so, Ryan for Life 724 uh, comments, So you found a purpose in life and that phrasing. Yeah, that's... Um, that actually yeah comes across as... Uh, yeah... Um, again, I think one of your previous comments that I forgot to highlight was uh, yeah, pressure, anxiety, selective mutism, minor seizure. Um, yeah, there's a certain bit of charisma need to be a good apologist. Now, what I'm going to do is there. Well, I'm going to quickly YouTube a. So entertain yourselves for a couple. Entertain yourselves for a couple of minutes, my my dear audience. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, there was there's a particular clip that I'm thinking of as as I as I'm saying that there is a particular clip that ah found it found it this is going to be uh okay let ah I'm not going to play an ad that's uh that's interesting so give me a okay so I'm going to uh maybe we should turn the volume down so it doesn't like blast people's ears but yes, so let me go share screen, share screen, uh, Chrome tab, and okay, if you're listening, three, two, one. So, so, so this is from the Oprah Winfrey Show, and it's about a child preacher who's very yelly. Kids are just regurgitating Bible verses. I want to know if you really understand what it is that you are preaching. Yeah, make up a reading comprehension test. <laughs> Kids to see if they really You're not on mic. So this this student's an A know, student in me... the school. C could you g preach for us and let us and then tell us what it is you mean? I'm biblically. Mm -hmm. Could you, Duffy? Could you? Okay. Well, here we go, here we, here there's, we a there's a verse. There's a verse. You want him to preach? Yeah, yeah. Get up and preach. Get up and preach. Yeah, go ahead. Stand up right where you are if you want to. Go ahead. You want, Jeffy, do you want to preach? If you want to. If you don't want to, The audience to, don't... shouldn't be able to intimidate you into this. If you want to do it, it's up to you. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words uh, in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed. Wait a minute, wait just a minute, wait just a minute, please. People tell us what I've read the Bible that applies to my own preaching is just like a trumpet. DA1, it says, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Stay away from the Bible, Duffy. Tell us tell us. Us. How do you stay away from the Bible if you're going to preach, though? The Bible says you're to speak as the oracles of God. Uh -huh. If you don't want to talk the way this Bible talks, you should keep your mouth shut. Classy. Okay, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Okay, so that was, um, yeah, so that was, uh, uh, thank you, Rider for Life 724, yes, I feel so bad for that child, um, but you can see from his, uh, from his dad that, uh, 
yeah, he kind of kind of gets it from his dad. So let me just turn my volume back up. Yeah, um, yeah, I can't help but think that Smith Wigglesworth was a lot like that kid. Um, so totally uh, indoctrinated into what he believes that you know. Um, yeah. So now, uh, where was it? Next, next paragraph. Well, ne yeah, next paragraph. Three, two, one. When I was sixteen years of age, the Salvation Army opened up work. I uh, opened up a work in Bradford. I delighted to be with these earnest Salvation Army people. It was laid very deeply upon to me to fast and pray for the salvation of souls in those days. And every week we saw scores of sinners yielding their hearts to Christ. In the mill where I worked, there was a godly man belonging to the Plymouth Brethren. He was a steam fitter. I was given to him as a helper, and he taught me how to do plumbing work. He talked to me about water baptism and its meaning. I can remember that he said to me, if you will obey the Lord in this, he may have something great for you. I gladly obeyed the word of God to be buried with him in baptism unto death and come forth from that symbolic watery grave to a new, a newness of life in God. I was about 17 at that time. And right of Life 724 leaves a comment. I see so many kids be told that they have to be a priest when they grow up and that pressure forces them into something that uh, they may not even want to do. It happens so often. Um, yeah, I, I agree, um, uh, particularly in those cultures, but also, um, who was it? There was, let me see if I can find, there was a, uh, a, an atheist. There was a particular atheist who I was, uh, No, I can't find. Uh... Oh, he he was an archaeologist, and he base he, he he's from uh his his uh, Latino. And he's basically saying that in Latino in in Latino culture, you know, it's kind of expected that you become a preacher. And he actually started off as a preacher, then he became an archae uh, you know, like an archaeologist, and then um. If I if I find it, I'll uh yeah, I'll yeah, let you know. But yeah, um. But this is the thing, like in. In England at the time, you know, Christianity was the predominant religion. And it's just yeah, interesting that, um. All right, so back to the book. It was this good man who taught me about the second coming of the Lord Jesus. Again and again, when I had the sense that I failed God, I would be troubled with the thought that the Lord would come and I would not be ready to meet him. From time to time, it was a relief for me to go to, to, go to work and find this godly man there. Then I knew the Lord had not come in the night and left me behind. Now this, now this part is interesting because. Actually, actually, interesting, interesting because you know this got this person was expecting the Lord to uh, to come in his lifetime, and he and he didn't, and this guy you know. Yeah, it felt like he was he was an earnest Christian, uh, you know, trying to, uh, yeah, trying to do the right thing by the by by the Lord, um, you know, who believed that he walked in his power and his knowledge and all that kind of stuff. Oh, there is a there is a delivery coming. Hey, son, could you grab that delivery when it comes to the front door, please? Thank you. I'm trying to shake the microphone, please. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> please, please, please go and get the, get the package, because I've been waiting on that package. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just uh, getting excited because there's a package that I brought last week, and it's finally, finally come. Oh, I don't know if you heard that knock, but yeah. Um, yeah, so this guy thought Jesus was coming in his lifetime. Obviously, he didn't. And it's like, surely... So I'm just watching uh, the shadows of my son pick up a box. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, um... 
yes, we recommend watching Jesus Camp. Um, thank you kindly. Um, yeah, Jesus Camp, yeah, I saw that. And um, if you want a little bit of trivia, um, Dr. Jim Majors, uh, who you made on, on Twitter, you know, Dr. Jim, um, apparently he was family friends with the with the lady who coordinated Jesus Camp. So there you go. It's a, uh, and right, so many Christians think that Jesus is coming in their lifetime, but it doesn't happen. Um, that is completely correct. Like every generation, um, you know, people say Jesus is coming back, Jesus is coming back, and it just hasn't bloody well happened. And this kind of reminds me of the thing I liken it to is can you not burp when I'm live on air? Sorry. There's a lovely lady who's listening to this, and all she can hear, all she can hear is you. Uh, she 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 commented you on your reading, and she thinks you're a very nice kid. Hmm. She might have take that back now. Hmm. What was it? Um, a beautiful mind. Uh, the movie A Beautiful Mind, where uh, I think John Forbes Nash, the great mathematician. He um, suffers from schizophrenia. And what uh, one thing that helps him realize that it's an hallucination is that the, the hallucinations that he, uh, that he has when, you know, when he's younger, he gets older and he realizes that the hallucinations are the same age, even though, even though he's aged uh, greatly. What are you after? All right, you might need to grab another one out of the box on the, uh, if there's no more there. Yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah, so, um, yeah, and, and this is, this is like, to me, this was like, well, hold on, you know, um, yeah, but, so let's say back in, uh, like the late nineties, I was, yeah, I fervently believe that Jesus would come in my lifetime. And now 20 years later, I'm still seeing people go, Jesus, well, the people who, the people who I listened to had died. And then I realized, well, hold on, if, if these people fervently believe that Jesus was coming in their lifetime and Jesus didn't come, then, well, hold on, there must be something, there must be something that's, so, so, so to move the mic, just a, Get moving around a little bit. Um, yeah, there must be something that's causing them to like not to to misread something, and it, it couldn't be that God is fooling people everywhere all over the world, could it? And that was one one thing that helped me. Uh, you realize I was uh, helped me realize that Christianity is just a religion. It's not a it's not a relationship. It's just a, a religion that people believe. Anyway, um, back to the book and how much... Okay, so there's only like two-thirds of a page left in this chapter. So, three, two, one. I continued with the Salvation Army because it seemed to me they had more power in their ministry than anybody else at that time. We used to have all nights of prayer. Many would be prostrated under the power of the Spirit, sometimes for as long as 24 hours at a time. We called that the baptism in the Spirit in those days. Those early salvationists had great power, and it was manifested in their testimony and in their lives. We would join together and claim in faith fifty or a hundred souls every week, and know that we would get them. Alas, today many are not laying themselves out for soul winning, but for fleshly manifestations. Ah, so the Rite of Life 74 writes, I never believed Jesus was coming in my time, even when I was a believer. I was a weird child on that account. Um, and it seems to... Mm. Yes, you, mate, you, possibly were, you possibly were a weird child. Then again, again, so was I. Uh, now, where was I? Um, I looked to the Lord, and he surely helped me in everything. When I was 18 years of age... I went to a plumber to ask for employment. I cleaned up my shoes with an extra shine, put on a clean collar, and applied at the home of this man. He said, no, I don't need anyone. I said, thank you, sir. I'm sorry. The man let me walk down to his gate and then called me back saying, there's something about you that is different. I just can't let you go. 
He sent me to do a job fitting a row of homes with water piping, which I finished in a week. The master was so amazed that he said, It cannot possibly be done. But he went and found the work perfect. He said he, 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 said he could not keep me employed at that speed. And Rider Life Seven Two Four writes in the comments, "I call BS on that story." Uh, yes, um, <laughs> yeah. As I said preachers, preachers, and their own anecdotes. Um, yeah, uh, take it with a large amount of salt. When I was twenty-four years of age, I moved to Liverpool, and the power of God was mightily upon me. I had a great desire to help the young people. Every week, I used to gather around me scores of boys and girls, barefoot, ragged, and hungry. I earned good money, but I spent all of it on food for those children. They would congregate in the sheds in the docks, and what meetings we had. Hundreds of them were saved. A friend of mine and I devoted ourselves to visiting the hospitals and also the ships. God gave me a great heart for the poor. I used to work hard and spend all I had on the poor and have nothing for myself. I fasted all day every Sunday and prayed, and I, and I never remember seeing less than 50 souls saved by the power of God in the meetings with the children, in the hospitals, on the ships, and in the Salvation Army. These were the days of great soul awakening. At the Salvation Army meetings, the officer in charge would constantly ask me to speak. I cannot tell why he should ask for me, for my speech was always broken, weeping before the people. I could not hold back the tears. I would have given a world to be able to speak in a more eloquent way. But like Jeremiah, I was a man with a fountain of tears. But as I wept before the people, this often would lead to an altar call. I thank God for those I thank God for those days, because the Lord kept me in a broken, contrite spirit. The memory of those Liverpool days is very precious to me. When I was about twenty three years of age, I was led to go back to Bradford, and I was strongly led to open up a business for myself as a plumber and give my spare time to helping the Salvation Army. It was there I met the best girl in the world. And yes, the Salvation Army. So uh, this leads on to Chapter 2, which I'll do in the next, uh, I'll do in the next, uh, next installment of the series. But yeah, um... So this is a guy uh, basically giving writing his own hagi hagiography. Um, yeah, it's very. Uh, it'll be interesting to know like how many people actually came to came to God and all that. But it's just interesting that like even though so many people come to God, um, firstly you know the Civil War of you know the uh, the eighteen hundreds you know certainly put paid to the idea of a divine uh, a divine force for goodwill um, it's like I, like the only thing we can really say God did was make people feel good you know that's uh, it's like really weird that you know yeah that's the only thing we can remember God for, yeah like it, I don't remember God stopping bullets I don't remember God you know um, breaking chains of slaves. I don't remember God, yeah, you know, lighting a path for a slave to run away from. You know, all it really was is, oh, I prayed and I felt good. Oh, that must be the power of the spirit. Oh, I feel a power over me. All that, all that kind of stuff. And yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, don't get it. But anyway, um, I'm going to end the end reading here. In the next, inst the next installment, also well, the next chapter of the book will be called "And Help Meet for Him." Uh, and this is where he uh, recounts the time where he met his wife. And uh, yeah, if you <laughs> uh, if you are a, a feminist, you may not like what you're about to what you're about to hear in this next uh, in this next segment. But anyway, um, I've been Damien, and I still am Damien, the Tall Friendly Atheist Dad. Check out YouTube. Go to YouTube, search for Tall Friendly Atheist Dad podcast, where you find all my other readings I've done so far and the ones I'm about to do as well, head on over to anchor.com, that's uh, anchor.fm forward slash TFA dad. Jump on Twitter at TFA pod or facebook.com forward slash TFA pod. My name's been Damien, uh, and this kid has been the warm reading son. No, you say, say warm reading son. Grr, grr, warm reading son. There you go. And yeah, he, he says goodbye as well in his own weird, in his own weird way. Yeah, uh, goodbye and stay, stay safe.